Welcome, everyone. My name is Willard Clapper. Today, I have the distinct privilege of interviewing uh, one of Aspen's veterans uh, as part of the Aspen Veterans History Project, uh, Mr. Dan Glidden. Uh, Dan, it is, uh, by the way, it's Saturday, March 17th, St. Patty's Day, and I was asking Dan if he was Irish, and he, pr he doesn't know, but I bet he is. Everybody is. And uh, it's, uh, we're at Grassroots Television, and uh, that's kind of a fun time, fun place to be. Dan is uh, 64 years old, although he's not bragging about it. And uh, I'd like to ask you a couple questions first, Dan, just for the recording. Um, what war did you serve in and what branch of the service? I was in the U.S. Navy from 1960 to 1972. Spent a year in Vietnam. A year in Vietnam. And what was your rank when you finished up there? I went into the United States Navy as a seaman. I came out of the United States Navy as a seaman. Perfect. <laughs> well done. <laughs> I'm sure that, uh, well, I understand that because that's what I did in the Boy Scouts. I went oh. in as a low end and quit as a low end. <laughs> anyway, Dan is fun for me to interview because uh, he and I share some history. We, we both were fortunate enough to grow up in the uh, beautiful Aspen area during the good old days. And uh, Dan, tell me a little bit about uh, your, your history in Aspen at the very beginning, who your family is because you have a very special dad. And, uh, you know, what, what was it like growing up here? Uh, family came up here in 1946. I was four years old. Uh, my dad came from New Mexico. He was a Western writer, Luke Short. Wrote 55, 56 Western. Uh, came up here to Aspen. Uh, we settled here. Grew up here. Fabulous place to grow up. Yeah. Yeah. Small town, knew everybody. It was great. You were one of my heroes growing up. <laughs> oh, we were, boy. Yeah, we were, yeah but there, that's a great deal. I remember I was telling Dan that uh, growing up, I was in one classroom, and I would look over the, uh, we ha had a doorway with a glass window, and I'd look over it, peering over like this, and guys like you would walk by, and I'd be going, oh, my God, look at those guys. Because we were all in the same building. We were all in the red brick building where we are today, uh, and it was a wonderful time. Um, what kind of things, give me an example, what kind of things you used to do when you got up at 10 o'clock in the morning? Because I know you slept late. On any given day, uh, summer times was fun. Uh, get on my bike at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock in the morning, come home for lunch. Mom would say be home for dinner time and rode my bike, played, goofed, climbed, had fun. Favorite places? Shadow Mountain. And why was that? Uh, we had the uh, King of the Mountain yeah. battles over there where we'd have a defending team and a conquering team and we'd Throw rocks and roll rocks down on each other and then play places and do it all over again. Mm -hmm. Great place. Yeah. You ever used to ride your bike on the mine dumps? Oh, yeah. Oh, was that fun? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rolled a few of the cars out of the, the old <laughs> ore cars out <laughs> yeah. of the tunnels. It probably was not the best thing to do, but it was fun. Yeah. Did you experience, as I did, that uh, it was really at that time a village taking care of a kid? Because I know when I was growing up, wherever I was, somebody was l watching over me. Oh. I thought I was totally independent, but there was always somebody oh, else there. Yeah. It was fun. And, you know, it kind of stayed in the family, too. Everybody took care of everybody, uh, everybody's kids, but uh, kind of kept, kept the thumb on them. Okay, now, good. as you left the, the younger years, you went into high school. And you went to high school here, and uh, you did all that stuff. Uh, you played sports. Which yep. were those? Yeah. Uh, football mm -hmm. and track. Did you used to practice on the old rotten field over here where the, ye or the yellow brick is? Yes. Yeah, see, I tell people about that, oh. and they go, what? They used to be cinders, oh, the old hardcore, hard rock cinder, get beat up, cut up, dinged up. Oh, yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. That was fun. Yeah. yeah. And then you did track. Did track. That was probably your best sport. Yeah. Oh, we knocked some heavy football, though. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, track was fun. Uh, as I told you earlier, we'd only in the wintertime or spring, we had snow outside, so I set up three hurdles in the hallway here, and over the first three hurdles, I was good. Yeah. Went down to Grand Junction in the springtime and looked over all 12 and said, oh, my word, have I got to run over all of those. <laughs> but yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Uh, so you, uh, high school was a great time here because uh, not, only, not only did you know everybody, but you knew everybody in town. And it was all, as you said, it was a big family. But what was, what was the real, what did, what did growing up, what did going to high school here give you? Because um, ultimately you, you, you either drafted or got enlisted, which I'll get to in a second. But before you did that, what was the, what was the strength of being here for you? Because it was just close knit, it's family. Everybody, everybody knew what everybody was doing. Everybody had fun doing it. Um, everybody took care of everybody else. So it was fun. Yeah. It was close knit. Do you see a difference today? Yeah. Um, just 
not necessarily the social or the economic differences. Yeah, it's just it's too big. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm I'm the school resource officer this year at the high school, and right. uh, great kids, but they're little cliques and different groups that uh, don't necessarily mix. Yeah, and you didn't really see much of that when you were in high no. school. No, we all together. No. Yeah. And the ranch kids would mix with the uh, oh, yeah. whatever else there was oh, around. Yeah. And, yeah. Were you a hippie during the uh, '60s there? No. 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 Nah, didn't get into it. Didn't have to. Nope. Yeah. All right. Well, good. So uh, that brought you to the end of your high school career, <clears throat> and that was a highlight, I'm sure. But then, the struggle, here came Vietnam, and that's where we're going right now. Did you, uh, uh, when it came time, did you, did you get drafted or did you enlist? <coughs> uh, I got drafted. Long story. I went, graduated from Aspen High School, went to CSU, was huge. I got lost. Yeah. College was so big, I got lost. Two years there, didn't do well. Came back and did two years in the Peace Corps. Went down to Peru for two years. Came back in 65. Went to northern Arizona. Finally found my major. I wanted to be in anthropology, archaeology. Oh. Uh, Colorado quit drafting at age 26. I got drafted six days before my 26th birthday. Wow. It was be in Phoenix Monday morning, 8 o'clock. Be there. But, but you, you said you were in the Navy. Yeah. So, I did, did. They drafted you into the navy, no. or did they, when they drafted this, you, said you get a choice. Yeah. Well, this is the armed service. Uh, you know, the armed service physical. If you walked in, you passed, which I did. <laughs> um, I want to get on. Took a look at the Air Force. I had a 12-month waiting list. The Coast Guard had an 18-month waiting list. Uh, if you went into the Army, the Marine Corps, you automatically were going to Vietnam. So I talked to the Navy recruiter. He said, "Great, sign up for four years. You're telling me you want to be a photographer when you get down there and." You're good to go. Yeah. So, done deal. Done deal. Yeah. And we have some photographs here. We'll we'll be looking at those yeah. a little bit later. Yeah. But uh, obviously, you you did become a photographer. Well, uh, I was on my own. I showed up at boot camp with my camera, and my company commander looked at me and, in not so gentlemanly terms, said, "What are you holding in your hand?" I said, "It's my camera, sir." And he said, "Good. Throw it away because you're now radio." And I said, "No way." <laughs> so we butted heads for four years. Right and, away. Yes. Huh? Yes. He didn't know he was dealing with Dan Glidden, did he? Well, of course. I don't uh, know who had the harder head out of that. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> All right, then. Uh, so you, there you are in boot camp. You you show up for the first day, and, and he tosses your camera. What was boot camp like? I mean, I've heard stories. I did not. I was, and I, I have to say, fortunate because I believe I was. Uh, I did not. I didn't get drafted. Uh, I didn't have to go to Vietnam, but uh, I was always, you know, what, what would that have been like? What was it like for you? Hard. Um, I flew under the radar for four years, um, basically. I was the oldest one in boot camp in my company. Mm -hmm. uh, so sense, yeah. uh, you can see the idea behind let's break down the individual, then rebuild them, remold them in, in your style. So the first half of boot camp was that you know, marching and drilling kinds mm -hmm. of things. Uh, Did you see those as mindless tasks yeah, at, at yeah. the time? Don't rock the boat. Go with the, go with the flow, because you know that's the, if you fight the system, it will destroy you. So yeah. go with it. So I did. I did what I needed to do. Uh, survived boot camp, roughly six months, nine months. Uh, when I went to my the, to Phoenix, we took a battery of tests. They determined that I was going to be a radio man. So for that next year, they sent me to radio school for an entire year in San Diego. That radio at that time was teletype. So oh. you, you'd be on a ship, and all of the messages you sent to and from ship, 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 the show was all teletype. So that was my training for the entire year. That's a long time to learn how to type. Well, you learn electronics and basic electronics, electricity, oh. code, Morse code. Oh, my gosh. So it was a Some before lights, all that stuff. So it was a pretty complicated. Well, it, was, it, it wasn't that difficult, but it was long. Yeah. And they held the thread over your head that if you flunked out of radio school, you'd go out into the fleet as a bosun's mate. I ended up, after Vietnam, out on the fleet as a bosun's mate. And what is that? Uh, take care of the ships, drive them, paint them, launch Lop the boats, them. launch the helicopters, all that kind of stuff. So did you find that during that time uh, you you sort of formed an attitude about what you were doing that was not necessarily conducive to where you were going? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Survival. 
So that part was okay. You knew how to survive. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it was disappointing to me because I, in good faith, had gotten in and wanted to get into the Navy and said, I will gladly go to photography school, send me to it, I will do the best I can. Mm -hmm. And uh, that never materialized. Yeah. So it was not necessarily sour grapes, mm -hmm. but it was disappointing. So, uh, you know, go with the flow. Yeah. Now, I've known you a long time, and I know you to be a committed, uh, kind of patriotic kind of guy. You love this country, as, at least as I know, and, and your profession that you've done after you, you came back, the years that I've known you. Um, did you find that your, your natural commitment, your natural tendency to do the right thing was compromised in, in those beginning, you know, that, that boot, boot camp and that experience? Not initially, because you think, you know, this will work out, or maybe, you know, I will ultimately get into photography. Yeah. Um, I went to Vietnam <coughs> and um, finally ended up doing some photography work. My company, my, the base commander said, if you want to get into photography, take the courses. He said, I will write to Bupers. Bureau of Personnel in, in Washington, D.C., I'll try and get you into photography. Mm -hmm. And he did, and it didn't work. They said, because radio is a critical rate, you stay in it. So that was uh, you know, just uh, another disappointment. I realized I was going nowhere. Yeah. So I just said, okay, I'll do what I have to do. But as you get into the war and as you see what's happening, uh, you have to question what, yeah. what we were doing, why we were there. Yeah. Now, I'm going to get to that here in a second. You, you were in Vietnam. Now, when you finally had to ship out, when was that? And uh, tell me how that whole thing went down. Well, you get, <coughs> I arrived in, in Vietnam June 6, 1969. Uh, I'd known for a month prior to that my orders were to Saigon. Comnav 4 mm -hmm. v was the communication center for all of Vietnam. Wow. So you were in the middle of everything. So no, I was right. So I was stuck in downtown Saigon. But I knew. I mean, they flew us one day. You you arrive at Travis Air Force Base and you take a 19-hour plane trip to Anchorage to Yokosuka to Japan to Tonsuna. Mm -hmm. uh, I originally started out there in the comm center. They call they have what's called port and starboard shift. You'd work two weeks of days. You'd work two weeks of nights. And I'd go up at night and I'd look at the flares and the tracers and everything in the horizon and say, wow, that's cool. Uh, what finally clicked was I, one night I was, um, this was a comm center for the entire country. Yeah. All the messages coming in and out would come through there. 3.30 uh, in the morning, I was underneath a desk with a putty spatula, scraping the wax buildup off the, underneath the desk. So the light bulb kind of went on, what am I doing here? This is not what I want to do. Yeah. And, and I, very, I very clearly remember I went to the chaplain of the, and said, one, oh, I want out of the comm center. Get me out of here. Next night, I saw the watch commander, the I, Captain Fink. And I said, sir, I want out. I don't want to be here. He said, you sure? Yes, sir. I said, you're absolutely sure. <laughs> yes, sir. Next day, here I was. Whew. River boats in the Mekong Delta. Now, what, what is it? I know, I know something happened there that triggered that. Did you feel that you needed to be out and be more a part of yeah. what was going on no. out there? If you were there, you might as well be there. Well, it's not, I mean, this, you know, reflecting back how much Peace Corps influenced my right. future life. Because two years in Peru, you know, you're down there, you're down there with the idea of helping people, trying to accomplish something, trying to work with the people. And I decided sitting under a desk with a putty knife in a cement bunker building is not what I wanted to do. I wasn't quite sure what I was getting into. Yeah, yeah. But uh, no, I said th there's got to be a better way. So I, I got this chance to go down there. That's a pretty gutsy move. Not necessarily smart, but I... <laughs> yeah, when yeah. you look back on it now, you was it still the right move? Oh yeah, no regret. No, no wrong. So you, uh, you wanted to get into some combat. Not and, necessarily uh, combat. I wanted, uh, I wanted to do something with the Vietnamese people uh -huh. other than go over there and kill them all. Yeah. And I mean, my my experiences are different than the majority of the veterans you right. have interviewed or you see or talk to because when they went over there, the only Vietnamese they ever saw was the one that was trying to kill them. Yeah. That was not my case. Really? Yeah. Talk a little more about that. Where, who did you see then? Well, um... 
the Navy base was uh, about 60, 70 miles below Saigon. And you have to understand the, the geography of the country. The Parrot's Beak is Cambodia. Mm -hmm. It came down into Vietnam. Well, there were two main rivers that came down out of Cambodia, the Vam Koh Thai, the Vam Koh Dong. Well, there are a series of canals and everything that came down through there to the Bemak River. The Bemak River went directly through Saigon. So for the 1968 Tet Offensive, right. all the Viet Cong did was bring everything down from the Parrot's Beak, down, down to Bam Koh Dong, up to Saigon. So the idea of the Ben Luck Base, it was dredged out of the river, built right beside the river. They said, we want to stop this interdiction. We want to stop the supply. We want to stop the troops. We want to stop the Viet Cong. So that was the idea behind the river boats, the river bases. I see. So I connected up with, when I got there, it was probably 60% American crews, 40% Vietnamese on the river boats. When I left, they were all Vietnamese. So I was there for the Vietnamization, the turnover of American assets to the Vietnamese. So wow. what I'm doing is I'm going out with the Vietnamese, we're trying to work with them, show them, teach them. So you were teaching and helping and helping them. Yeah. Helping yeah. them to take over. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we don't we don't hear enough about that kind of stuff. Well that it was, was interesting because uh, my ability to fly under the radar, uh, I was in Saigon and I think the Navy sent us over with literally wool <laughs> wool yeah. <coughs> uniform. That's what you need over there. Yeah. So on some old timers there, and he said, "Well, go back to the the grab bag room and find some lightweight uniforms." So I went back and found four or five short sleeve camouflage shirts. Well, they had cloth stripe for a lieutenant on the collar. Oh no! So, so you I were cut, so I you go, were a lieutenant. Oh well, I cut them off, but it left the laundry marks on the collar. So when I would show up to the Vietnamese, they thought I was a lieutenant. So I never, I didn't say yes. I didn't say no. I just stayed low. We had a SEAL team there that had three officers uh -huh. during the day. That's when you do what you wanted to do. They needed a fourth for volleyball. So I would play with them. Well, Americans thought I was the fourth SEAL officer. So the Vietnamese think I'm a lieutenant. The Americans think I'm a, a, SEAL, a officer. SEAL officer. So I just stayed as low as I could. It worked nicely for you. Yeah. yeah. Well, I got into what is interesting. I got into through a, a helicopter accident that took the Psychological operations officer. Oh. Um, Rhoda came off, killed him. So they said the base commander said we need a replacement. I said, good, as long as I don't get in a helicopter, I'm cool. Yeah. Uh, but I got into PSYOPs, which is trying to work with the Vietnamese. You go out with PSYOPs teams, Vietnamese. You broadcast. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes you go out at night. Vietnamese are very superstitious on it if a body is dismembered or broken apart, the soul roams forever. So we would play on that weakness. Right, right. Make a recording. This is your soul. Really? But go out in the daytime. You go out for med cats. You go, you know, you do medical. You go to a village, a couple boats. You park the boat right up on the dock and say, bring everybody that you can. So hurt, wounded, sick, bleeding, cut, whatever. Treat it. Help these people. So that was kind of the idea behind it, and that's why I wanted to get into that, because yeah. I felt if we don't connect up with the people, if you don't work with the people there, you're not going to win the war. So your most memorable experiences probably have to do with your dealings with the Vietnamese yeah. people. Yeah. Because here I am, I'm working when finally the June 6th of May, the turnover was completed. I was going out from the Vietnamese boats. I was the only American going out. Wow. So you go with two boats four or five guys, a dozen guys on two boats, and I'm, I'm not there as an advisor. There would be American advisors that would go out there with them on, a, you know, on occasion. These are the military advisors that tell them what to do, mm -hmm. those types of things. I'm going out as a, you know, as a, uh, I guess a, you know, kind of a gopher. Yeah. Do Whatever. the medical stuff, see what we can do to help. So you, in a way, were sort of self-deployed. I did. I yeah. flew. I, I had yeah, you were under radar. You went out and yeah. you did the things that you thought mattered the most yeah. and made the most difference. Yeah. And although Commander Sigmund never did see any of the pictures, he said, go take pictures. He said, go out and do that. He said, I want you to do that. You, you do a good job at it. You go out with the people, work with the people. Go do it. Yeah. So that was very rewarding to me. So now this, again, just look at the situation. I'm working, first of all, with Vietnamese because I trust with my life every day. At night, I go out with them. 
So I'm dependent on them entirely. The people I deal with are Vietnamese all the time. So I'm not trying to kill them. They're not trying to kill me. Yeah, I'm they trying knew to that. help them. Mm -hmm. So that's a different, that's a whole different approach. Wow. And did you, uh, how did you deal with the language barrier? Um, surprisingly, some of my college French came back. Oh. And a surprising number of Vietnamese do speak French. Right. So it was kind of pidgin French, pidgin English, pidgin Vietnamese, but uh, yeah. we got by. And most of the boat skippers were a little more educated, had a little more knowledge. They might have been trained. Some of them were trained on American bases or were trained, obviously, by Americans. So, you know, between those three languages, we could get by. Yeah. You always had an interpreter, so you, know, you knew. Yeah. No. Wow. And even you had an interpreter when you were <laughs> under the radar. Well, sometimes. Um, sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. Well, let's take a second here and look at a couple of these pictures. Uh, I'm not sure how you guys are going to do this, but uh, um, I want you first to show us the pictures that you took you know, when, when, you, when you were out there, and then let's save the Vietnamese people one, because I want to talk about those later. Okay. So just sort of sh go through these individually and tell us what's going on, and I'll just... Uh, you guys have these? Okay. okay uh, the base, again, of Ben Luck was dredged up out of the river, and uh, as you can see in the background here is a, a fence. The idea behind that fence, it's steel mesh, was to oh, keep see, the Viet Cong yeah. from shooting rockets on the level. They'd have to lob them over, which was good. But I was, I, I was sitting down on the beach, riverfront, if you will, one evening, and just, you know, looked out. Here comes, you know, here comes a sandpan full of folks going home. And then Beautiful half an hour, picture. half an hour later, you know, helicopter coming in. Uh, we have a helicopter base pad on the base. And, uh, I just happened to be right place, right time. And what kind of camera did you use for this? Well, I had a Pentax, a uh, nice. Uh, oh, you had a pretty uh, good yeah, camera nice then. Pentax. And then this one, I think, is one of my favorites. Uh, as we were going up the river, I call this uh, freedom of religion. <laughs> but it's a Catholic church set off, you know, off the riverbank, and it's just shot up, blown up, burned up. And this was kind of the start of the rainy season. It was. You know, the clouds were coming in, the, the sun, the moon kind of thing was mm -hmm. starting. Uh, so I just uh, took that. You know. Well, it's a beautiful picture because you can't really tell if it's color, black yeah. and white. Um, well. And the huge contrast between the, you know, the, the, the I, I like looking at the water, which is nice and calm and placid, and then right, yeah. on, the, right on the shore. Well, then this is the, you know, different, same church. Oh, yeah. Uh, daytime. Yeah. Uh, but again, freedom of religion, uh, freedom of expression, so. And who destroyed that church? Um, that's a good question. Probably uh, my venture would be the government, uh, Arvin Troop, probably, thinking that the Viet Cong would use that for something. Or it could have been the Viet Cong saying, okay, we're not going to have any mm -hmm. Catholic religion here. So You must have seen a lot of destruction while you were over there. Yeah, yeah. Was, uh, was there any destruction that you would... You know, I think in terms of, you know, Agent Orange and defoliation and all the other things that, that happened over there from, and of course I was not there, but just reading about it, was there any just wanton destruction of property just to, to, just to mow it down? Well, um, I lucked out. I was uh, further up the river, but uh, got away from the Agent Orange. Uh -huh. But you see, you know, you read about Agent Orange, it's just... Oh, it's devastating. Mind-boggling. Yeah. Um, you know, the spray, basically sprayed the entire Mekong Delta. Um, so you were close. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's kind of interesting, you see, read the stories. Uh, when I was in Vietnam, the chief of naval operations <laughs> was a general, uh, admiral called uh, Elmo Zumwalt. Uh -huh. He gave, approved the orders uh, to spray Agent Orange in the Delta. His son was in the Delta and was sprayed with Agent Orange and died from Agent Orange. So here's the commanding officer who gives that order, probably realizing he's put his son in harm's way, and his son died of complications from the Agent Orange. That's a tough one because then you look at that and you go, "Well, what a, what a heroic man to do that to well, place country yeah. above sun." Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know either. I, <laughs> I have a hard time with that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it, war is war. Uh, you know, if you see the the randomness of it, the insanity of it, you know, and you just wonder why. Yeah. Why this was destroyed, I don't know. 
Was it a, a political threat? Was it a religious threat? I don't know. Yeah. Well, it had to be difficult for you coming from a beautiful pastoral Aspen, Colorado, where everything is absolutely perfect, as we saw it, yeah. uh, and go to that. Um, well, um, it hasn't been any easier because when I read, you know, why we were there and what we were doing there, it, it's disappointing, it's discouraging, and I see the repetition of it happening today, oh, and yeah. I wish it weren't. But, um, you know, I don't think we as a government ever really understood the Vietnamese people. I don't think we understood their traditions, their culture, their history, mm -hmm. and as a result, uh, we lost it. Well, let's talk a little bit about the Vietnamese people. I know you have some beautiful pictures here, and um, my experience, which has been very limited with Vietnamese people, is that they're hard-working people. Um, and really hard working. And uh, could you show us some pictures of uh, of the your experience with yeah. the Vietnam people well, and let what me, that was like? Will it, if I may, just show you? Um, I was on a, a PBR most of the time. Oh yeah. Okay. So small uh, fiberglass boats. Uh, and it's a PBR. River Patrol Boat Patrol Boat River. Um, but this gives you an idea. This picture is one day we would go up a river of this size. So you can see there's not much room, there's not no. much uh, you know, maneuverability, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the next day we'd be on a river this size. So it depends on where you go. You go with, uh, you know, militarily you go with where the intelligence tells you there are crossings, where there are Vietnamese, Viet Cong, et cetera, et cetera. We would go on, we would take these boats to go on our med camp. Mm -hmm. Go to village. It was questionable security-wise, so you take a couple of the bigger boats. I but um, and it had to be kind of terrifying for you to be driving up those shorelines, especially the smaller ones, oh, yeah. knowing that somebody could be over there saying, "I'm going to take you out." Yeah, yeah. Well, and then the things that you see. I mean, most of the day patrols were stopping boats, checking boats checking ideas, talking to people, where you're coming from, searching the boats, where are you going, have you seen anything, those type of things. Um, if you found somebody that was carrying something, what did they do? Well, depending on what, uh, you know, the, the, at this stage of the game, the Viet Cong would mainly work at night because they knew if they were caught out in the daytime, the chances are not, not, not good. good. <laughs> not good. Um, but, you know, you, if you can go back, for a second to this picture, and you can see the wave, the wake that you put up. I saw this happen, unfortunately, on a couple of occasions, but this is a, 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 a sandpan that if you're not careful with a wave, you'll swamp it, you'll yeah. sink it. And that's their whole life. That's their whole life. So now instead of making a friend, you've just alienated. Um, this is an idea of, again, just going to a village. Drive right up on the on the shore, unload, get your corpsmen, get your doctors out there, and treat anything, anything that comes in. And it's rewarding in a way to see that you can do it. But then you know you get a disease that is treatable, yet those people don't have money, they don't have the means to get the medication. Um, you know, and you know as they walk away, yeah, that may be it. But, you know, you hope, does this, have you made some impression on some person here that says, you know, you're not here to kill them and blow them up, you're here to mm -hmm. help them and save them, try and make their life better, so. Did you find that as you spent more time with the Vietnamese people, um, they were more willing to accept you as friend and to understand why you were there? Well, yes, to a degree, but you have to realize, again, go back to the history understand the culture of the Vietnamese. Um, their first question other than why are you here militarily, what do you want, why are you here? What do you want? You so there, it takes a while to gain their confidence, gain their trust, and you hope, I mean you can only guess that you yeah. did that, accomplished that. And you were probably always dealing with the, uh, that, that I guess it would be a pretty frightening situation where you don't know if the next person that walks up to you out of the crowd is going to have a grenade attached to yeah. them. Well, we did a couple of MedCap things where you, you get a loudspeaker and you start walk away from the boat and you want to go to the village and, and 
so the clouds peak, and then you realize suddenly that I'm getting further and further away from the river, from my boats, from my help. Oh, yeah. So, you know. Um, Vietnamese people, I think of all the pictures I took, this has to be my favorite. And I look at this, I, I've, I've named all of these pictures I call these the victors. But you wonder, you know, you look at the eyes, you look at the faces, you know, what happened to this kid? What was their future? Did they live? Did and this is 1969, 1970? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, the, the, the hurt, the pain that I have is I, I look at the Vietnamese military guys that I work with, the boat captains, the skippers, the boat crews, and I wonder what happened to them. Yeah. Because they, you know, they're, if they were captured, then they're implicated as working for the United States or the Saigon government, so now are they re-educated? Are they killed? Did they die? Did they move? Did they escape? I don't know. And it's it's bothered me for years. I've wondered for years. Yeah, you know, now that I think about that, that's one of those forgotten parts of that war. Oh yeah. You know, we many of us, myself included, I'm, I was very anti-Vietnam, um, and and I probably didn't know enough. But now that I look back, and and you mention that, you wonder about what happened to those people that were on our side, whatever that yeah. might be. We sort of forget about that. Yeah. Well, you read about the, you know, the, the Hmongs in the, the highlands or, you right. know, in, in Cambodia and Laos. These people worked with us, fought with us, and then we, we basically had to leave them abandoned them. Where are they? What happened to them? And they were a tough people, yeah. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Um, these guys, it was funny, uh, they're very proud to be peasants, very proud to be farmers. And before I, they would let me take the picture, this guy had to get, you know, get the hoe that he the has, hoe, yeah. and this guy had to get his pith helmet on. And once they had that, they're very proud. Yeah, they're neat people. They're uh, they're very, they're hardworking. They're once they get to know you, they're very friendly. They're very open. Well, they certainly are industrious. Those that have come to the United States, oh, yeah. they're doing yeah. very well. And the kids, I mean, you know, you stop again the, the boat, the med caps that we do, you know, and these the kids always show up. They're, you know, they want handouts. They want which you can't blame them, but, uh, yeah. you know, kids are kids. I mean, they're goofing here, playing around, you know, and again, I just look at these little guys and wonder what, what happened to them. Beautiful faces. Yeah. They're just gorgeous. And this, the, this I, I mentioned earlier, I, I tried to explain to these kids to line up, and they did pretty well except for this one. I'm not quite sure what <laughs> he was thinking. I mean, he's in the line, but. Uh, he was a little shy, I guess. Yeah. But, you know, you look at, look at faces, each of them, you know, these four gals in particular, you know, and I mean, look at the eyes, look at the expressions. What are they thinking? What happened to them? You know, this little kid, what's he thinking? Yeah. You know, you look at one of these, you know, look at this little guy. What's, whatever happened to him? You know, and if you, could, if you could have helped them, did I make their lives better? Did I do something for them? I don't know. You hope you did? Well, we'll talk a little more about what it was like when you came back, but at least when you left, you had you had some feeling that you had done something productive, and it's primarily because you were under the radar, but yeah. you had done something productive. Yeah. Well, I was trying. I mean, there were you know programs that we did. Um, you hope they worked. Uh, the pacification programs, uh, when we left, they were working. Uh, how much longer did? I don't know. But, uh, you know, again, these are the forgotten people. Yeah. Have you been back since? No. You have any interest? Not really. I mean, it's pretty. It's pretty country, but it's very tropical, hot, steamy, sweaty, mm -hmm. everything. Well, right now it is one of the gangbuster places yeah, for tourists yeah. to go. I guess um, uh, the Mekong Delta, the highest thing in the Mekong Delta, if you could flatten out all of Aspen, would be uh, Red Butte. Yeah. And the rest of it is just as far as you can see is just level swamp. or green or lush swamp, river, bog. So uh, it was a pretty country, but I don't have any great. Desire to go back. So when you left, you left. I left. Yeah. yeah. Well, tell me, um, what was a day? Okay, you had you, you mentioned earlier that you had you had time off and you had time on. You know, there were times that you were doing things, and then there was off time. What did you do during your off time? Give me an example of an off day. What did you do? There weren't many. Uh, only in the sense that I want. I just wanted to stay involved. I'm not. I, I'm not good at sitting around doing. You're nothing. an antsy guy. Yeah. I know that. Yeah. So um, again, because I could plot my own course, if you will, do what I wanted to do. My commanding officer never basically knew what I was doing. Wow. 
So I could take my choice. I could go out on the river boats if I wanted. I could go out daytime. I go out nighttime if I wanted to. Night times were different, a different story. But um, I knew some of the helicopter guys. I'd go take helicopter rides. You know, uh, we had escort uh, boat duties where uh, some of the river bases further up the, of the river would need all their supplies, so they'd come by barge. So you'd hop on the boat and escort them. Mm -hmm. um, go out on, again, day patrols to check boats, check rivers, check canals, check boats, stop people, where you're going, what are you doing. So I stayed busy, so yeah. I'm, not a, I'm not a sit around and do nothing. Now, did you find that keeping busy like that is what kept you kind of sane? Oh, yeah. I enjoyed yeah. it. You know, well, and again, it's, uh, it's, it, it's the different philosophy, the different situation I was in if I'm not trying to go out and kill people. And I, I have no, I can't say I have no problem with people who are doing that when the only Vietnamese you ever saw was one who was, was trying to enemy, kill you. Yeah. yeah. So I'm trying to, you know, trying to work with these people, trying to, trying to you know, learn more about them, help them out some way. So you were on an advanced Peace Corps mission here <laughs> in your well, mind in a way. Kind of, yeah. 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 You know, if you figure you can do something, help somebody, yeah, and have the opportunity to do it too. So now the the other thing that I wanted to ask you about was I've heard so much from other people about the weather and how the weather played on your psyche. Um, you know, obviously it's a it's a very tropical area that you had the rainy season come in and the dry season. Walk me through the year in terms of the weather and how it affected you. Well. You know, you you read the stories of you know the highlands get cold and you get cold at night. You need you know ponchos or parkas or something. I've never been up in the highlands in the mountains, so I don't know that. Mm -hmm. But I'm you know I'm assuming. I mean, obviously it's true the higher you get, you know, the cold, cold chills, the cold nights. Um, basically, here it was wet season or dry season, <laughs> and that was it. Great. So the the wet season, you know, it it, it rained just literally day and night, just pour. Just rain, rain, rain. So it's you know it's kind of a struggle. It's it, I don't know if you ever lived in a tropical climate. It's visited. It's brutal. Yeah. Because everything you know, cuts get infected. Food rots. Stuff you can't preserve. Stuff. It's a struggle. It's muddy. It's dirty. It's wet. Equipment rots. It rusts. So it's just a constant mm -hmm. upkeep of, of of equipment mainly and food. Just trying to survive. You know, and, and these people are dealing with it on a daily basis. But what was fun, I mean, the, the thing that's amazed me about this river is we were probably 100 miles up off the coast, and the tides would drop 6, 8, 10, 12 feet daily. And you'd still experience it that far up? Oh, yeah. Oh, it yeah. just totally blows my mind. Wow. And you then the, the stories of the rookie boat captains that come up at night and tie their boats up, and then, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah right. if you're not careful, you're caught. But, um, I mean, we had a thing, uh, you know, you wonder... It's kind of like family, how far up along the river people knew people. Uh -huh. Because on any given day, if we said we were going on a, a medical mission somewhere, we'd go up the river and we'd come by a tributary, chuck a concussion you made in water, and there's fish. So mm -hmm. we'd get as many fish as we wanted, and we'd drive up to the village, and they'd have a pot of rice. And, I mean, we'd sit down and have a feast. Oh, and if you brought food, that helps. Oh, man, yeah. yeah. So not only are you sharing you show them that you're willing to share with them and honor what they give you, you're giving back in return, and then you go ahead and do your medical stuff. So, so that's where you learn to fish, huh? <laughs> yeah. DuPont spinner, <laughs> it's, it's like the best. It's the old joke, yeah, you're yeah. going to fish or... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, that's fascinating. Um, is, is there anything, um, any other experiences that you can rem that, that come to mind that were memorable, either humorous or non-humorous or whatever that you'd like to share? Um, you know, from your time there? Well, I can't, nothing that stands out, nothing really stands out. It's just out. that ongoing daily yeah. grind to survive and. Well, but it's something that if you enjoy doing it, then it doesn't become a grind. So, so, so the secret is to make it enjoyable. Well, make it as best you can. Yeah. I mean, we had, again, there were river bases going all the way up to Cambodia. Mm-hmm. And one day I just, you know, I just, hey, where are you guys going? Okay, we're going up the base. So we drove up to the Cambodian border. And we happened to drive by, a, as we were getting close to the border, a convoy. It must have been two, three, four miles long. Nothing but tanks, armored cars, armored personnel carriers, that kind of stuff. I said, what's going on here? Well, it was the invasion going into Cambodia when 
mixing no, the cage going right, into Cambodia, right. which we should have done years ago. But just, uh, you know, again, to see see that and wonder where that all ended up, where that was going. I'm glad you're not a part of it. Glad I'm not a part of that. Yeah. But it was interesting to see, I mean, you could go to the different bases and just see the different areas, the different challenges that they faced that we didn't. Yeah. So it was, it was fun. Incredible time yeah. you got out of it. Let me ask you, uh, you you are a big family guy. Um, you know, I know your family, but your 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 mom and dad and everything. How did how did you stay in touch with them during that time? How did they endure? How did they live with you being over there? Well, other than uh, letter writing, that's it. I mean, we had no, we didn't have the overseas phone. You know, if you mm -hmm. wanted to go into Saigon, you could do that. I didn't. Uh, Saigon was overwhelming to me. Yeah, I'm not a city person at all, yeah. and it is. Well, you couldn't even make it through Fort Collins. No, no, <laughs> huge. Uh, but you, you know, you just do your best. I had a little recorder, so I'd record my feelings, my impressions, and really? I'd, I'd mail them home. Yeah. Do you still have those recordings? Yeah, a couple of them. Yeah. Oh wow, that'd yeah. be something to yeah. to go back and listen. And to And I mean, they were my lifeline for the film that I'd send. Uh huh. I'd package it up, you know, right. and send, get it developed, save it. So, yeah. you know, rolls and rolls of film. Have you developed them all yet? Oh, yeah. You have them all? Oh, yeah. And you have them all codified and organized? Well, and not, well, they're there. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, you know, got yeah. some of these, so. That's, that's a treasury. Oh, yeah. Someday yeah. that'll come out. Someday well, you'll do that. I got a lot of, I mean, I wish we had more time. The, you know, the, the memorabilia that I have, you know, the, yeah. you, you had ration coupons for alcohol, tobacco. Oh, um, really? Yeah. I mean, ID, the MPC was military payment currency. They wouldn't pay you in, in, Not in, money. in money yeah. because it was black market. You, know, you could make a killing on black market with U.S. dollars. Yeah. So they give you, it looks like it's like Monopoly money. And it's, <laughs> what's this, you know? But I know I had another friend who was in the military over there, and he, at least he told me he ran a whorehouse as an <laughs> American GI, and I was going, that's pretty interesting. Well, you made some money on that. He said, yeah, I made a lot of money. Yeah. Going, if you had those inclinations, I mean, uh, black market, you could. It was there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess that's the way with any war. Yeah. yeah. It's unfortunate. And, and, and back to your family, did they, were they comfortable with you being over there? Or? No. They just you know, endured, too. Young and stupid. Yeah. They, I mean, <laughs> it was not necessarily by choice. I mean, no. I ultimately had the choice when I got my draft notice was, you know, where are your beliefs? Where are your feelings? I could have gone to Canada. Mm -hmm. Very clear. You know, yeah. I could not have lived with myself. Yeah. yeah I mean, that's, I felt it was my duty. And I think, you know, I can't fault any of the soldiers that went over there or gals, guys or gals. I can't fault any of them going to Iraq mm -hmm. because it's a feeling of duty. It's a feeling of obligation. It's something you have to do. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm not just saying that as a, this blind off or whatever they tell me to do, I'm going to do it. No. But you know, you see your, you know, your family, World War II, Korea, you know, you did it because you, it was something mm -hmm. you were expected to do. Yeah. And um, I went there with that train of thought, that mindset, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm disillusioned now. Yeah. Disappointed in the direction we're headed. Now, that yeah, that's that's a that's a great segue here. You know, I I don't want to get heavy and political with this, but I know that. When Vietnam vets returned, they were not treated as they should have been treated. Um, a lot of them came back with heavy post-traumatic stress syndrome, oh, yeah. and, and of course it wasn't even defined at that time. It wasn't even acknowledged. It still barely is, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but when you came back, what sort of experience did you have? Um, was it one of those ugly ones where guys are spitting on you, or did no. you come back? Uh, um, and I'm glad you asked that. And I, you know, looking back, my Peace Corps experience, uh, I was in Peru for two years. So th Vietnam only one year. I mean, obviously, the, you know, not the same type of situation. But mm -hmm. I came back. One day I was in, got to Lima. Next day I was in New York City to see my sister. <laughs> and that was culture shock. Oh yeah. Magnified. I mean, she had to take me literally to a water spigot and say, "Here is, here's a glass of water. water. Drink it. It's okay to drink." So I came back from New York. I stayed there for a week. I came back to Aspen. And other than my parents, you know, I'd see people on the street. They'd say, where have you been? Haven't seen you for a while. Okay. I've been in Peru. Oh, neat. 
Did you know the Yankees won last week? You know, so yeah, yeah. that kind of cold shoulder that people really don't care, or the ones that did care, like your family, would mm -hmm. say, you know, you try and sit down and explain to them what you've done, and as much as they wanted to know and learn and listen, they couldn't comprehend it. Yeah. They just didn't understand it. Now, and I don't want to sound selfish or closed no, off and saying, well, because you weren't there, you don't understand it. But they didn't. But it's true. It's true. Yeah. So I got on. So I was in Saigon, made, made my way to Saigon June 6th. I was home June 6th, 19 hours later. Got to Travis Air Force Base and went to San Francisco, flew out of there. Got reamed by the shore patrol because I didn't have a dress uniform. I said, guys, this is the only thing I got. You know, they were going to court martial me. They were going to, you know, throw, throw, drag me, you know, throw me in jail. But to have the the demonstration, there was nobody there. Period. Yeah. Walked in, got hassled, walked out, got on a plane, came home. Walked in the back door of my parents' house. They about had a heart attack. They're having a party, dinner party, and I walked in. Wow. And then same thing. You know, you see people say, "Where you been? I haven't seen you for a while." Oh, I was in Vietnam. Oh, cool, dude. See you later. So it's just just this yeah, wall. Just a wall. Yeah. Of people that either didn't care, or didn't want to know, or couldn't relate. But I had or, I, or I was all ready. Of the above. Yeah. Yeah. But I had that from the Peace Corps. So when I came home, I said, "No big deal." Hey. You were ready. Yeah. Yeah, I'm good. So it was easy for me. Yeah. But I can. I mean, my heart goes out to the guys that you know. And you brought up PTSD. I mean, uh, I think you know part of the history of the of the memorial that's here. Yep. You know. But before that, I started. A, a talk session in the salt yes veterans welcome you know and that was that was a a, a calming relief for me yeah. because i felt again i was doing something mm -hmm. and get to vets and we just sit down and talk well and and as you said earlier you're talking to people that get it yeah yeah talking to me i don't get it and, and i try my best yeah. um well it's, it's hard it's a trap that if you know you i mean you've seen it in your brotherhood yeah. of firefighters, mm -hmm. you know, and you can talk to someone about that till you blue in the face. And they'll nod exactly. their head and they'll try and understand yep. it, but if they haven't been there, they don't understand it. Yeah. It's not that you're being aloof, it's not that you're being special. They just don't understand. Yeah. So you talk with vets, you try and talk with people who haven't been there, they don't get it. And, and if you, not if you think about it, World War II, there <coughs> were so many young men over there, and it was falling so close on World War I that everybody kind of did get it. So when they came back, it was a different deal. Yeah. Of course, it was a totally different war as well. Yeah. Uh, but with the Vietnam War, there were so many that didn't go, like me, and relatively few like you who did, so that when you did come back, you're talking to a bunch of guys like me who don't get it. Yeah. It makes, yeah, well, it makes total you know, sense. Well, you look, I mean, I, I still can remember the picture of the, of the I think, the sailor in New, New York Times right, Square, kissing, kissing the, the gal, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but you look at World War II, they all came back together. Yeah. You went over as a company, division, battalion, whatever, you came back all together. Took you a week to sail over. Okay, we, you know, come back. That's it. Time to decompress, to right. talk, to share. Yeah, the war ended. Yeah. Anyway. I was on overseas national, flew over to Vietnam. I didn't know anybody. Whole plane load of guys. Didn't know a single person. Sitting by wow. myself, you know, wondering what, what am I gotten into here? You know, June 6, 1970, I'm on National Airlines coming back. Didn't know anybody, didn't know a soul, all just hodgepodge people. So I never went over as a group, never came back as a group. And I think the military, at least they tried in Iraq to, mm -hmm. you know, send them all over as a group, bring them all back as a group. And that's very important. Yeah. But I missed out on that. So it's, you know, if you're not aware of that. So perhaps there were some lessons from Vietnam that have been transferred to the uh, war in Iraq, and yeah. at least that one. Yeah. Yeah. But it's huge, you know. It's, it's, it is a yeah. huge one, yeah. It's it's uh, it's a part of being any team, whether it's a football team or whatever. It, it essentially is a team. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you don't have that, you know. Amazing. Well, in your uh, your experience coming back, uh, as you said, and I've heard this from others, they just sort of, you know, took you back, dropped you in, said, see you later. Um, was there anything made available to you if you'd wanted it? Any extra help or? Well, Mm, not really, but now I have to qualify. Um, I came back. I had a month leave. I had two more years in the Navy. So mm. I met some vets in that two-year time frame, people I could relate to, 
So I could talk about that. So when I finally walked out of the U.S. Navy after four years, you know, I, I was okay. You cleared it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, no, there was a stigma, I think, with PTSD, as you say. It probably hadn't, hadn't even been invented, you know. But if, you know, if you go seek help, if you, you know, go to get counseling, it's something you're weak, you know. There's, yeah. there's a sign of weakness or you're crazy, you know, that kind of thing. So there was a huge stigma back then. Yeah. And right now we're looking at the uh, the repercussions from this uh, Walter Reed Hospital oh, stuff. And I know it's, we'll be out of time with <laughs> this interview, but uh, you would have thought we would have learned more. And to allow that to happen after the experience of Vietnam is no, it's good. sad. I mean, and it's not as if Iraq snuck up on us. No. How many things have we done between Vietnam and Iraq that we could have been yeah. picking up on? We need to treat these people when they come back. And I know with post-traumatic stress, I, I actually do those uh, debriefings with the firefighters and emergency responders around here. So I, I know how important oh, they are. Huge. Um, and you were very lucky in that you were still in the Navy and you got to go back and, and be with people that got it. Yeah, so yeah. Well, you did have some lucky breaks. Well, you had some good luck. I don't yeah. It sounds like you took good advantage of it too. You didn't. Well, uh, you, didn't you know, it. it's not you know you, what's the old saying? You get a handful of lemonades, you know, you make some that's make, right. make some lemonade. Yeah. So I was fortunate, and I, I mean, I have no, no yeah. regrets. Um, you know, I have to say, and again, my heart goes out to these veterans now that have been in heavy, heavy combat. You know, I mean, I didn't have friends killed and body parts and dying right. in the military. You know, I mean, I don't know. I can't. Imagine what they're going through. And these are the people now. We need to take care of them. Yeah. Well, if there's anything we can all agree on, it's that. Yes. Uh, you know, the, whether we agree politically on being there or not, no. th beside the point. Yeah. And I mean, even this is huge. You know, the, to it's, it's, it's still, this is another chapter. Right. But it's also closure. It's yeah. also, uh, uh, you know, uh, addressing it, a final realization. Are you still doing your, your talk sessions uh, with the no, vets? Or um, they've sort of that's uh, that one by the wayside. Yeah. It was replaced, I think, by our efforts through the memorial that we mm -hmm. did. So, um, but Tell me a little bit about that. How, how did that all start and where is it now? Just <coughs> We need to have that recorded somewhere. How did that all come about? Um, a friend of mine, Chuck Cole, I think we just sat down. I don't know who came up with it. I think maybe Chuck came up with it and said, you know, we need to do something. And, uh, boy, it was a long process. We started with uh, going to city council and the mayor, who I will not name, uh, his offer, gesture of support was two plane tickets back to see the wall in Washington, D.C. So you can imagine those kinds of walls mm -hmm. that we had to deal with. Um, presented, struggled, argued, uh, talked, begged, pleaded. But the city got nowhere, and uh, one county commissioner, and I will name him, Bob Childs, bless his heart. Yeah, wonderful man. Um, liked the idea. We walked out on the sidewalk in the middle of winter. He said, pick a snowball, throw it where you want the memorial. That's, that's where it's going to be. And uh, a lot of then Rick Bush, may he rest in peace. Yes, um, indeed. He was the kind of the, Chuck and I were burned out, and Rick was the Rick took it motivation. Over. Yeah. And okay, but, and, you know, as a result, there it is. Yeah. Rick was a powerful guy, oh, quiet, great, powerful, moving great, guy. Great yeah. guy. Mm -hmm. And I mean the community. Rick's fondest dreams were let's get the community involved in this. Let's yeah. make it a community effort. And it is that now. Yes, it is. I'm just delighted. Yeah. That and marching in the parade on July 4th. It's amazing to me how many, how many vets are still good. around. Yeah. 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 And they're here, you know, and, and, and most of them are, you know, they're, they're viable, functioning, you know, valuable part of the community. Yeah. There are a few that are still in the woodwork, and you know those are the guys you got to yeah. get. But uh, you know. so you made it back. Did you back. Uh, go back to school when you finally got out of the Navy, or did you do anything no. beyond that? No GI Bill stuff. You just sort of left it behind you and said, uh, "Adios, adios." I'm yeah. onward and upward. Yeah. Well, I came back here, and I got. I was then married very shortly thereafter with a with a family. So you came back and decided to move on with things. Yeah. yeah. And it's, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned that. I, in a way, I admire the Vietnamese people. They've gotten over this. They've gotten over Vietnam. I mean, you see the country, and for mm -hmm. them, that's history. It's past. It's yeah. in the past. It's done. And they've carried on. They're going on with their lives. And, and to some degree, I mean, I'm not dishonoring, disrespecting any of our veterans. No. But, you know, 
we need to follow the rhythm of music now, though. They've gone on. Yeah. Life goes on. They've carried on. It's over. It's done now. And they still honor their past, but in different course. ways. They don't have to. They don't have to dredge it around and parade it anywhere. They no. they know how to do it. I wish I could have met. First of all, I had a better command of the Vietnamese language. I mean, I yeah. wish I could have gotten more into that because they are they're beautiful people. They're hardworking, dedicated, loyal. They're good people. Yeah, I'm glad you had that experience. Oh, yeah. That's a wonderful thing to share, I think. Yeah. Um, when you finally got back to Aspen, you started a new career. And what was that? And where are you with that now? Well, it was come back and get a job to feed the family. It was Rio Grande Motorway, which has now since gone. Yeah. Uh, Ten years for the Aspen Ski Company. What did you do with the ski company? Worked on lifts and snowmen. Oh, really? I yeah. did not know that. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Grand time. I remember Rio Grande Motorway, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and all those characters. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. And uh, summer jobs are with Morrison Knudsen up at Ashcroft. Uh -huh. In 1990, January 1, uh, Aspen Police Department. And you're still with the police department. And as you mentioned, you're the SRO out at the high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, you and I were talking a little bit earlier, and, and uh, the importance of having someone like you meet and greet those high school students on a daily basis cannot be overstated. It's a, yeah. it's a powerful thing. Well, this fallout, as we mentioned, from Columbine, and you know, you want to get away, and I'm glad the police department is doing it, of the stereotypical cop. He's unapproachable, he's hard-ass, he's, you know, you can't talk to him, he's not involved. And that's just the opposite of what yeah. a cop should be. Yeah. And I mean, we're afforded that luxury here. But uh, no, to be with the kids every day, uh, it's, it's great. Yeah. A lot of fun. Well, it's, I know it's appreciated, and you're yeah. the right guy to have there. Well, Not only do you, you have a wealth of experience, but you have that calm demeanor that, uh, that needs to be in that position. Well, yeah. Most of the time. Most of the well, time. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you've got a sense of humor, too, which I think yeah, is that's you need. Yeah. For those of you out there, you need to know one story. It's uh, kind of funny. Dan, I don't know if you have this anymore, but you'd call his house, and his answering machine would answer, and you'd hear an airplane. And you go, yeah, this is Dan. I'm flying about uh, 13,000 feet over whatever, you know, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Remember that? Oh, yeah. I laughed so hard at that because it was so creative, and you honestly didn't know whether you were out there <laughs> flying or not. I mean, the sounds, yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, I mean, the key to uh, you know, key to life is have a sense of humor, laugh at it. Yep, I agree with you on that one. Of course, I've never been accused of that, so well, I, don't, I don't have that problem. No, you have. <laughs> You're the man. Anyway, you are now at a point in your life where uh, what's next? You've got a few things ahead of you. What can we expect from Dan Glidden? Well, as you know, I wrote a couple westerns that uh, I think I made it dollar ninety-five for Perfect. ten years of work. Uh, did your dad make much on his yeah, first one? He was a good he? living. Yeah. 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 I think I need to reiterate. His, his dad was Luke Short, and anybody who's a western uh, western novel. Uh, uh, you know, that expert knows that name is top of the line. Well, so 55, 56 books. 56 that books. That he wrote over a lifetime. Yeah. So. So but I uh, wrote a couple, and uh, as I mentioned earlier to you, the, f the first one I wrote actually was working for M&K up Ashcroft, and I'd have a uh, stick of notes, and I'd get an idea, and I'd stick, it on, down, the, yeah, stick it on the dashboard, and at the end of the day, I'd have this whole pocket full of stick of notes, finish the book, send it to my dad's agent, and he said, great, write me another one. Oh, man. So <laughs> six months later, nine months later, book number two came out. And uh, they were published. It, it's, a, it's an honor to know they were published. It, it's fun. I didn't make any money. But I'd like to try that again. And I've been dabbling in photography. So. Yeah. I could see that world for you. Yeah. 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 And you're fit and strong. And, uh, and I understand you're a grandpa now. I'm a grandpa. Yeah. Two beautiful little ones. So, yeah. And your daughters are... Here and there and everywhere. Here and there and everywhere, like yeah. they should be. Doing well. Yeah. yeah so. Well, good. Life has been good. I'm very fortunate. Yeah. Well, boy, when I, I, after talking to you, of course, I knew very little of this, but uh, you were a lucky guy. <laughs> well, let me let me go back on our our uh, to growing up in Aspen with the Shadow Mountain yeah. episode. <clears throat> this is insanity, uh, as only a high school kid could do it. But we would divide up into teams. And we'd get four or five guys go up on Shadow Mountain. And you had a pocket full of marbles and a slingshot and a, a sling. 
and we had pipes and crowbars and everything up on the mountain. So the kids would all start by the boomerang, yep. and they'd run across that empty field. So we'd start lobbing around. Lobbing rocks about that big at them as it came across the field. So that's cool. So then once they got into the trees, we'd roll rocks down in the trees. Biggest rock, bigger rock you could get, the better. Down into the trees. And then if they got out through the trees, we'd shoot marbles at them. Okay, time out. Change sides. Then we'd all go back and do it again. We did this all summer long. <laughs> and nobody, nobody ever. I yeah, mean, the God was, it. he had to be looking out after you. Really, seriously. Yeah. And we did it just all yeah. summer long, day in and day out. Grand time. Well, I'm 10 years younger than you, and we used to do similar kinds of things. Well, only with me, it was we were mostly throwing dirt clods at each other and climbing around Smuggler Mine. Yeah. That was my insanity. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How I lived through that one, I'll never know either. <laughs> God. No. Great memories, great time shared, and uh, it was wonderful talking to you. My um, pleasure. Is there anything else you would like to uh, just throw in the mix here as we bring this to a close? I'm just, uh, my compliments to everybody involved in this, I think this is just, I am so honored, delighted to be able to be part of this. I mean, I, my hat's off to all of you. Well, when I saw your name on the list, I made sure that I was going to be the one that interviewed you. Well, so, uh, it's fun. Yeah. I mean, to Daryl, to you, to Colonel Mayor, I think it's just, I'm honored to be part of it. It's this. a good thing. It's, it's a, a really good thing. Good thing. Yeah. Anyway, and, and on that note, I'll thank you for, uh, for sharing with us and uh, the, those treasured stories. And uh, they are now going to be in the Library of Congress, I think, is where they're going to eventually end up. This is the part of the Aspen Veterans History Project. Uh, I would like to thank, I think, the Aspen Thrift Shop, the ladies of the thrift shop, whom Dan knows quite well. Um, that's where he and I got all of our clothes, I think, for about 20 years. <laughs> and uh, also the Aspen Elks Club. I understand they've donated quite a bit of funding for this, and uh, they have a special sensitivity for this kind of thing as well. Uh, thank you to Grassroots and all those involved. I don't know who all they are. It doesn't make any difference. Uh, we're going <laughs> to close out here on St. Patty's Day or 2007. Dan, thank you, and My thank pleasure. you all. Thank you. Thank you.